This WebEx service includes a feature that allows audio and any documents and other materials exchanged or viewed during the session to be recorded. By joining the session, you automatically consent to such recordings. If you do not consent to the recording, please do not join or participate in the session. This WebEx service is intended to supplement the classroom experience. Duplication or redistribution of lecture capturing recordings is prohibited without appropriate consent. All right, in this webinar, we're going to go over parts of Chapter 10 and parts of, cha of Chapter 12. Um, the parts in Chapter 10 are the wrapper classes, which start on slide 21, the string class on slide 32, and the string builder and string buffer classes on slide 49. Then we'll jump over to Chapter 12, and we'll do file I.O. on slide 52. And if we have time, we'll do um, exception handling overview on slide 4. So let's get to it. All right, you see the advantage up until, up until now, you see the advantages of object-oriented programming from the preceding chapter. The chapter, this chapter will demonstrate how to solve problems using object or the object-oriented paradigm. I'm going to go straight to, I think it was 21. To the wrapper classes. Um, you'll note here that we have very familiar names. We have Boolean, character, short, byte, integer, long, float, and double. Now, the only difference that we can see up till now is that these are all uppercase first letters. These wrapper classes are intended to allow um, us to take advantage of a class that wraps around a primitive type, such as, let's say, Boolean. And if we can go ahead and create a Boolean class, then we can create methods within that class to do a lot of um, frequent functions that need to be done on Booleans. Same thing for characters, shorts, byte, int, integers, long, float, and double. So all of these are considered wrapper classes, and they are intended to provide methods um, for the primitive types. The two that are used most frequently are the integer and the double classes. Those are wrapper classes. Here are the UML diagrams for those two classes. And you can go see down here, you've got a max value constant and a min value for the integer wrapper class. And you also have the constructors and then you have byte value, short value, int value, long value, float value, double value, compared to two string. Then we have some static methods, value of, value of, these are all overloaded methods, and parse int, um, which will return an, in an integer. And then this one also um, allows you to pass it a string and a radix, which is a base. So if you wanted to change the base from base 10 to base 16, you could just put a comma and then 16, um, and um, you will go ahead and change the base for, to get the value. Likewise, over here is the double class, and this pretty much mirrors the, int, the integer class. The integer class and the double class have constructors, and they have a max value and a min value, and they have many conversion methods, which come in very handy. You can construct a wrapper object either from the primitive data type value or from a string representing the numeric value. The constructors for integer and double are, and here's the two integer constructors, one that receives an int and another one that receives a string. Likewise, the double receives a double value or a string. Here are kind of the, uh, here are some constants and some uh, restrictions, the max value, the min value, and this is for all of the different wrapper classes. 
Most importantly, we're going to get into the conversion methods. Each numeric wrapper class implements the abstract methods, double value, double um, uh, float value, int value, long value, and short value. These methods convert objects into primitive type values. There is a value of method contained within the numeric wrapper classes, uh, which is um, used to pass a string representing the value, and it will convert it over into a value of an int or a double. Here are some examples down here where we are we have a string 12.4 that represents a double value but it is a string so if you use the value of method inside the double wrapper class you can assign that into a double object of type double and you can do the same thing for the integer wrapper class You have used the parsed int method in the integer class to parse a numeric string into an int value, and likewise um, parse double method in the double class to parse a numeric string into a double value. Each numeric wrapper class has two overloaded parsing methods to parse a numeric string into an appropriate numeric value. I'm going to go over to NetBeans now, and unfortunately, this is not running but what I did was to take all of the examples in these slides and put it into a source file and then run it now unfortunately because of some strange reason I can't seem to run anything in this um, version of NetBeans uh, we're just going to have to go through this so for instance, um, we don't have output to look at, but if I put the string 9, which is only one character, but it's a string that has a character 9 in it, I can use the parse int method in the integer wrapper class and store it into an int variable called x. Then I could print it out, and it will print out the value 9 as uh, to a character. Here's where we use the radix. So I am using the parse int overloaded method. And in this case, I am passing it a string, which is A. But I'm changing the radix from base 10 to base 16. And then I assign that into x, which is of the type int up here. And when I print x equals the value of x, it's going to be a 10. Next, we have a um, parse double. I pass it a string of 5.23. And likewise, this method, the parse double method, will go ahead and store the 5.23 as a double value in the, um, in the variable called C. And this prints it out. This also does the same thing, where you do a va double value of of 12.4, this string, and it will go ahead and put it into the double um, object, the double object of the type double. And likewise, a string of 12 will be put into the integer object of the type integer class. Then to print those out, you would need to use the two string method from each of the double and the two string method from the integer classes in order to print out the values of those those values in the object this slide is an example of boxing and unboxing in the Java Development Kit 1.5, it allows primitive type and wrapper classes to be converted automatically. For example, the following statement in A can be simplified as in B. So we have a, um, an example here where we have an integer array 
The reference variable name is int array, and we are declaring, creating, and initializing all in one statement. And in this case, we are putting a value of 2, of 4, and of 3 into this integer array. This is the equivalent of writing the same statement, or writing another statement as follows. Here's an integer array, the reference variable name, and we are initializing it to 2, 4, and 3. So these two boxes are identical. This is new in JDK, and this is what's known as, as boxing. You can unbox this by these statements. We've got an integer array of 1, 2, 3, basically the same as up here with different values. And then you can unbox it by printing out, doing a system.out.print line, and having um, uh, these get passed as, as arguments. The first element in the array plus the second element in the array plus the third element in the array. And that will give a value of 6, and the system.out.print line will print out a 6. We're going to skip over big integers and big decimals because we don't really use them too frequently. Um, but I do want to talk about the string class. Constructing a string. We have a few different ways in which to do that. We have um, the first way, which is to um, declare a reference variable name called message. It's of the type string. So this now will create an object of the type string initialized to welcome to Java. Our conventional way is to use the new keyword, which will create the object of the type string. The reference variable name is message. And the argument that gets passed to the constructor is the string welcome to Java. We can also create another string, the null string, um, by coding it this way. When you create a string, now you have the ability to obtain the string length and individual characters in the string. We can concatenate strings. We can um, find substrings, um, compare strings, and convert strings. There's many different methods that you can use in the string class once you create the string object. So here's the example where we have string message equals new string dot uh, new string welcome to Java. That creates the object initialized to welcome to Java. There is a shorthand, which makes things a lot easier because we do use string so frequently. And you can we just code it as string message equals welcome to Java. A string object is immutable. Its contents cannot be changed. Does the following code change the contents of the string? And we have a string variable or reference variable called s, and we're initializing it to Java. Now we go ahead and we take the string HTML and assign that into the string object called s. Does that change the original contents? The answer is no. Let's look at an example. At an example here, we have um, the first statement here, where we declare um, s of the type string. So s is a reference variable. It's going to point over to an object of the type string initialized to Java. Again, the contents cannot be changed. It's immutable. The second statement here changes the reference value to no longer point to a string object initialized to Java. It will then create another string object initialized to HTML. So the string object is now unreferenced, but this does not get changed. This just gets unreferenced. So strings are immutable. Another object, and this is what's known as garbage, and that will get collected by the Java Virtual Machine if there is no reference to that object. 
Next are intern strings. Uh, since strings are immutable and are frequently used to improve efficiency and save memory, the Java Virtual Machine uses a unique instance for string literals with the same character sequence. Such an instance is called intern. For example, the following statements here. We have S1 of the type string initialized to welcome to Java. We have another S2 reference variable object of the type string where we use the new keyword initialized to welcome to Java. And the final is a third S3 object of the type string and that is initialized to welcome to Java as well. What happens in these three occurrences, the first one, S1, points to the object, welcome to Java. Because S2 uses the new keyword, this will go ahead and create another object in storage. The reference variable points to a different object with the same character string, welcome to Java. S3, on the other hand, does not use the new keyword. It is of the type string, and it does have the exact same character sequence as S1. Since we're not using the new keyword, this now gets pointed. This is interned now, and S3 now has the same reference variable, the same pointer as S1. So when we print out, S1 is equivalent to S2 is, S1 is equivalent to S2 is going to be false because it's not pointing to the same object. If we print out S1 equivalent to S3, and here's the, here's the code, um, the Boolean on that would be true because S1 and S3 have the same pointer, both pointing to the same object. And here's the trace of that. We can go through that quickly. Um, replacing splitting strings. In the string class, there are many methods that are very valuable to us. And here is the UML diagram for the string class where it shows some public uh, methods. Replace an old character with a new character. Uh, replace a first character. With a new, uh, with an old, an old string and a new string, replace all. So for all occurrences, it will replace, and then we can split uh, a string. Here are some examples. Uh, welcome dot replace e with uppercase a will return a new string that has the W and then the E is replaced with an uppercase A and then the last E is also replaced with an uppercase A. This is the replace first method in the string class and this will replace the first E with AB and you'll just get W-A-B-L-C-O-M-E. This E is unchanged. Welcome dot replace E with AB. Well, you'll see here every occurrence of E gets replaced with AB. And here we have the string welcome getting repl re replacing the EL with the AB returns a new string WABCOME. Here is where we can split some, some strings. Uh, we have an array of strings. The reference variable name is called tokens, and we have this string here, and we're going to split this where there is a pound sign. And we see that there is a pound sign here, and there's a pound sign here. If we run this for loop, it will go ahead and split this string into three separate tokens, Java, HTML, and Perl. Wherever there is a pound sign, it will go ahead and create a new token. There's another thing known as a regular expression. Um, regular expression is complex to beginning students. For this reason, two simple patterns are used in this section. But at the back of the chapter, um, in the back of the PowerPoint, 
for this chapter, you will see that there uh, are many different regular expressions that become very helpful. Um, a couple that come to mind are you can reference the Java string, and that matches Java exactly. Java dot equals Java, and Java is fun mat dot matches, and you can use the asterisk, the wild card, and that will go ahead and match anything that begins with Java. So this matches with that. And there are many other examples. Um, I'm going to go jump over to my uh, NetBeans here just to show you. Um, here is the example of the boxing. And unfortunately, we don't have any output because it won't output for what reason, I'm not sure. Here we have uh, the three strings. I call them message one, message two, message three all created differently, and then I printed them all out using the two-string method of the string class. Here is where I created um, the two objects, S, which points to Java, and then another S, which points to HTML, and then I go in and I'll print this out, and it comes out as HTML, S.2String. Here is where we're replacing. So I did an example. I'm using new strings because the first, the, these strings are immutable, so I need to go ahead and assign them into another string object, S1, S2, S3. And here's where I do the replace. Um, where, where S1 is welcome to Java. So I'm taking S1 and replacing lowercase e with uppercase a. And that will go ahead and print out uh, the wherever there's an E, a lowercase e, with an uppercase case A using the two-string method. Here is where I created the tokens using the pound sign delimiter. And I split it at the pound sign. Here is uh, string S5. Java is fun, S6 is Java is cool, and S5 dot matches Java, and that will be true. These are all true. There's another regular expression where you can go ahead and rather than use the wild card, which means anything after that, you can use a period. So I have S8 initialized to Java, and S8 dot matches j dot v dot so these dots are like placeholders which means that they can be any um, character and if it's if this starts with a j has any character then a v and then any character you'll get a match on s8 okay back over to the powerpoint for replacing The replace all, replace first, and split methods can be used with regular expression. For example, the following statement returns a new string that replaces a dollar sign, a plus sign, or a pound sign in this string right here. It replaces those characters by the string triple N. So we have a string object getting created. A plus b dollar pound c dot replace all and wherever there's a dollar a plus and a pound we're going to replace it with three ends and then you print out s and then you'll see that a gets printed the plus sign gets replaced with three ends down here then there is a b that gets printed and then we replace the dollar sign here with three ends. And now we have three ends here. And then we have a pound sign here. So that pound sign will, will get replaced by three ends right here. 
And then we have a final C, which will get appended onto the end of this print message. So that's the replace all. Okay, the following statement splits the string into an array of strings delimited by some punctuation marks. We have an array of strings. Its name is tokens. And it is this string right here. And we're going to split this string wherever there is a period, a comma, a colon, a semicolon, or a question mark. This for loop will print out each token, and it will print out a the word Java, C, C sharp, uh, C++, and that's it. The string class provides several static value of methods for converting a, a character, an array of characters, and numeric values to strings. These methods have the same name, value of, with different argument types, char, an array of chars, double, long, int, and float. For example, to convert a double value to a string, use string dot value of 5.44. The return value is a string is, is a string consists of the five, the period, the four, and the four. Let's go back over to here to see if there were any. Here is where we replaced all of these these um, string delimiters. And then printed them out. And here's where we did the value of 5.44. And that will come out when you print this as 5.44. But it would be as a string. OK, next up is String Builder. And we'll just take a look at what the String Builder class does. We're going to create an object, SB, of the type String Builder. And we'll initialize it to Welcome to Java. <coughs> Excuse me. The um, Let's see, what are we doing first? So we, I've commented all of these out. The first thing that I'm going to do is re do string builder dot replace or SB dot replace. We have to reference the reference variable name to reference this object, the SB string builder object, and we're replacing. And the the arguments here, 11.15 HTML, will replace the Java piece, and up here it will now be replaced with welcome to HTML. Unfortunately, I can't print that out down there for you, you to see it. I do have comments here. So it says changes the builder to welcome to HTML. So in this case, the string builder and the string buffer are pretty parallel. But the string builder class allows you to go ahead and make what look to be changes to this string. So I changed it from welcome to Java to welcome to HTML. I can also now on this SB object, set character at the first character to lowercase w. And then this will go ahead and change the uppercase to a lowercase w in the output. Up here is where I could go ahead and append Java. And that will um, go ahead and append another Java on here. And if we printed that out, it would say, welcome to Java, Java. And here is the insert, where you can insert at position 11. And the output will then say, welcome to HTML and Java. Here's where we can delete. Position 8 changes the builder to welcome Java. So we remove the TO blank. And then this SP delete character at position 8 changes the builder to welcome O Java, so it deletes the T. The reverse, 
we'll reverse the letters and it will change it to that. Welcome to Java backwards. Okay, so I think that's enough for uh, strings for right now and string builders and string buffers are very valuable um, for you to um, modify and manipulate, interrogate and extract um, characters from strings. So become very familiar with these UML diagrams for that show all the different public methods for string builder, for string, for string buffer. I'm now going to go over to um, chapter 12 and talk a little bit about file I.O. I think that's around 50 something or other. Okay, the file class. The file class is intended to provide an abstraction that deals with most of the machine dependent complexities of files and path names in a machine indep independent fashion. The file name is a string. The file class is a wrapper class for the file name and its directory. We have here the file class. It's located in the java.io package. And you have many different methods here. Some We have some constructors here. And then we have some methods that you can invoke. The first one is the exists method in the file class. It will return back a Boolean, true or false. And it will return back whether the file exists or not. These others are, can you read the file? Can you write to the file? Is it a directory? In other words, is it a folder? Um, is file, is absolute, is hidden, get absolute path will return the, app, the, the path to get to that file. Um, and what are the other ones that are important here? Get parent will get the folder in which that file exists. You can get the last modified date, you can get the length of the file, the um, here's where you can make a directory. So there are many different methods available to you in the file class to interrogate to see information about a particular file. All right, let's look at test file class. Okay, here we have a file class. I am doing the uh, explicit. I'm not going to. I'm not using the import statement, so I have to explicitly type in Java.io to get the path to the file class. And I have a an object a variable name file. I'm going to create a new object of the type file. And the argument that gets passed is the name of the file, scores.txt. I'm going to look over here. And uh, let's go to my um, files. And right here, I have a file called scores.txt. Scores.txt has two records, John T. Smith with a score of 90, and Eric K. Jones with a score of 85. So this um, this statement right here now allows me to look at this scores.txt file 
and I can now ask the question, does the file exist? By using, by referencing the reference variable name dot exists, and it will come back as true because in fact it does exist right here. Next, the file has file dot length will return back the length of the file. What is this? This is uh, add those up and add those up and that's what it will return. Still can't run this for some reason. It's not doing anything. Um, so you get the number of um, characters or number of bytes in the file. Um, this will come back as a Boolean. It can be read. It can be written to. This is a Boolean is directory. That is not a directory. It's a flat file. It's a text file. Is it a file? File that is file will return true. Uh, is it absolute? I believe that's a true as well. Is hidden would be false because I can see it. Uh, get the absolute path. We'll go ahead and return the absolute path that it is on from my thumb drive all the way out to the file name. And the last modified date for this particular file, we can go ahead. We're going to need to go ahead and use the last modified method, which will return a date. We need, to, we need to be able to print that date out, so we're going to use the date method. We're going to use the date class, the constructor method, in the java.util package in order to print that out. And that will show you the last modified date of scores.txt. Get name will return scores.txt, and get parent will return the name of the folder that this file is in. So those are some examples of exploring file properties using the file class. A file object encapsulates the properties of a file or a path, but it does not contain the methods for reading and writing data from and to a file. In order to perform I.O. or input and output, you need to create objects using the appropriate Java I.O. classes. The objects contain the methods for reading and writing data from and to a file. This section introduces how to read and write strings and numeric values from and to a text file using the scanner and print writer classes. Here's the print writer class. Here are the public methods available to you and uh, what they do. Let's look at the write data program. Okay, since I cannot run this, um, let's see what this program does. It's called write data. I have a main method. And the first thing that I'm going to do is create an object of the type file. Its reference variable name is dir. And I am passing it the test dir directory name. Now over here in files, I have a tester directory. And inside that directory, I have scores.txt. This one's a little different. It has two, two records. The first one is John T. Smith with 100 and Eric K. Jones with a 99. So I create the directory. Now I've already created it, so it exists. If, it, if dir exists, then I say directory already exists and um, exit with a return code of zero. So in order for me to get past this, I would have to come here and right click and delete this directory. I don't want to do it now because I can't generate another one. But that will delete the directory as well as the scores.txt file. 
So let's assume for the moment that the directory did not exist. Then we are down here and we're going to make a directory. So we type in dir.make directory and that will create the directory up here. Next, I want to go ahead and use the file class and we're going to use the reference variable name file and the parameter, the argument that I'm passing to it is tester forward slash scores dot txt. Now we're looking to see if this file exists. It does exist. It's right here. If the file exists, we're going to put out the file already exists and end the program with a return code zero. So in order for me to get rid of that, I'd have to come over here, right click on it and delete it. I'm not going to do it because I can't recreate it. So I will assume that both of these are gone and we don't have a tester and we don't have a scores.txt. If that is the case, then I want to write to the output file. So I'm going to use the print writer class in the java.io package. And the reference variable name, the object's name is output. And I'm going to pass it the file object. Now I have an output object in which I can use the print method and the print line method to print John T. Smith. And then 100 after that, there's a space in between. The LN print line will now eject down to another line. Now this is not going to the console. This is going to the file the file that we, um, the object of the type of, of the type file um, that will eventually get put right here. I put another record out on a new line, Eric K. Jones and Eric's score is of value 99. And that now will go ahead and put the second record to that object. Then when we close the object, the output object, we close the file. And now this file appears in this tester directory because of this argument that we passed to the file object. And then when this, it would say um, build successful. And then I could go ahead and look and see that there is a tester and there's a scores.txt and the file was created. So there's an example of writing a file, writing a folder or a directory, and then writing a file inside that directory. Up front, we just check to make sure they don't exist before we do that. So there's your write data example. Next, I'm going to go show you the read data. And if we look at the file structure, structure, you'll see that we have um, scores.txt right inside the read data outermost folder. Opening this up, you see we have two scores. We have John Q. Adams with his 95 and Thomas A. Edison with a 97. Now we want to go ahead and read data. So we're going to use the file class. The reference variable name is file and we are passing it the string scores.txt. This, um, this scores.txt file um, needs to um, be created. It needs to be created beforehand. And now we're going to go ahead and use scanner input on this file. And now we're going to read this file, scores.txt. 
and we can use the next method from the string class. I'm sorry, the next method is from the scanner class and store that or assign that into a variable called first name. It's of the type string. So in this case, I've taken John from John Q. Adams and put that into first name. The next method in the scanner class will now allow me to go ahead and put, uh, what was that, John Q., Q into the middle initial. And then input.next puts John Q. Adams into the last name. Now I need to declare an int variable called score to receive the next value, the next int method. The next int method will take that score. John Q. Adams score is 95, and that will now get put into the score variable. And I can print out system.out.println, first name, blank, middle initial, blank, last name, blank, score. And if I could run it, it would go ahead and print that out to the console. And this will loop twice for as long as I have data. It now goes and reads Thomas A. Edison and prints that out. And then it will no longer, this will be false. And I now close the file with the input.close method. And that allows other jobs to have access to that scores.txt file. Remember to close your files, otherwise they will not be attainable by any other jobs. Okay, so that's read data. We went, we stepped through write data and read data. Um, I am going to jump up to the front now and go through some exception handling, and then we'll call it a night. Uh, the first problem is the quotient problem. And this is exception handling, where, as we all know, we are not permitted to divide by zero. Oops. So there's a tiny little program here called Quotient. We can get rid of this now. And all this main method does is it invokes the scanner, asks for two integers. We store the first integer in number one and the first the second integer in number two. And then we print out Number one divided by number two is, and then this is the mathematical, the arithmetic expression. Number one divided by number two. If I put four space two, if I could run this and put four space two, it would say four divided by two is two. If I ran this again and put two blank zero, now we have a problem because this is going to say 2 divided by 0 is, and then we're going to get a, um, an exception. And the program would abnormally end. And um, this is something that we really don't want to happen in our programs. So a way to capture this so that this doesn't happen is to introduce an if statement into the code. Let's look at quotient. with if. All right, so same program. We get the two numbers coming in, and the first thing that we're going to ask is if number two is not equal to zero, then we can go ahead and do the calculation. This prevents 
doing a calculation where there's a zero in the denominator. If number two is not equal to zero, do the calculation. Else, well, then number two is zero, and we're not going to do a division by zero. We're going to write something out that says we cannot do that. So that's a possible solution. Another solution would be to introduce a method. Now what do we have here? We have the same scanner input. We're getting two numbers, number one and number two. And the next statement says we're invoking the quotient method, passing it the two numbers. Down here we have a quotient method receiving two ints. And inside the quotient method, we ask the question if number two is equivalent to zero. If that's true, we're going to go ahead and send the message to the console. The vision cannot be zero. And also exit with a return code one. If the number is, if this is false, if the number is anything other than zero, then we're going to go ahead and do the calculation and divide number one by number two. So that's another way of doing things. But uh, it's really not a good idea inside a method to go ahead and exit from within the method. So the final solution is quotient with an exception. In our main method, we have the same code, getting the same integers. And here we introduce a try catch block. And um, what we do is we surround the code where there could be a possible exception, where we have a division by zero exception. And in this particular case, it's in the quotient, it's in the quotient um, method where we're passing it number one and number two. So we have a try block right there, and we have a catch block right here. And this catch block identifies any arithmetic exception is going to execute this catch block right here and print out exception an integer cannot be, be division can an integer cannot be divided by zero and in this case the the execution will continue so um, in here let's step through inside so let's step through the code now we're going to come down and assign Let's say um, 2 goes into number 1 and 0 goes into number 2. We're going to go ahead and now invoke the quotient method, passing it number 1 and number 2. That's 2 and 0. Down here in the quotient method, number 1 is 2 and number 2 is 0. And if number 2 is equivalent to 0, that's true. We now throw an exception. Throw new arithmetic exception. The argument is division cannot be zero. And this throw new arithmetic exception will come up to this catch block. It's almost like a method call. And because this is an arithmetic exception, we are now going to go ahead and print out to the console exception, an integer cannot be divided by zero. Then this interrupts the, the flow of the program with this throw new exception statement. And now we execute the catch, 
and then we drop through and we print out the execution continues. So this has captured a division by zero and put a message out that says exception and integer cannot be divided by zero and then it allows you to still keep on processing. The program does not abnormally end or advent. So you can code your solutions this way and you can continue on processing if somebody happened to put in a zero in the denominator. Okay, I think I want to stop right there. That's probably a good stopping point. Um, we've covered uh, wrapper classes. We've covered um, file I.O., reading data, and writing data, and also some exception handling overview. Um, does anybody have any questions on what we've covered up till now? I have Michael Shiro on at this point. Michael, do you okay. have any questions? Yeah, I was about to say, um, so you meant to say uh, the directory creates a folder in the file section, am I correct? The directory, are we talking about file I.O. now? Could have been like that, yeah, that's what you said uh, in the read write data thing. All right, let me go back to those, to the programs. That. Okay, yeah, so what's your question now here? Uh, so wait, d the director creates a file uh, uh, for the, the project in the file window for the this project? Tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me which line you're on so I can follow you. Um, what are you looking to, looking at? DR, D-I-R, which is a java.io.file. Uh, what file? Uh, are you look, are you referencing any one of these file uh, line numbers here? The one like saying texture. This one right here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's line four. I okay, so five, what's your question? Line five. Line five. Line five. Okay. It, okay. All right. So what we're doing is we're creating an object. All right, of the type file. Once okay. we create the objects, in order to reference. Use the reference those um, methods for that object, we have to precede it with the dir reference variable name dot exists to see whether or not this test directory tester exists. This is going to return a true or a false. If it already exists, that would be a true, and we're going to go ahead and print out directory already exists, then end the program. Okay, so the question I guess is, is what is the DIR? Yeah, that, something that's like that. The, that's the reference variable name that needs to be coded, followed by a period, followed by the method name. The method name is exists. What about the concern of multiple strings? Since uh, it's sometimes with the use of display underneath with the concerns of the file. Uh, where are you referring now? Um, strings, the one you, the test chapter 10, that thing? Chapter 10, are we on this same program here? Or are we going someplace yeah. else? Yeah, this is chapter 12. This is chapter 12. Oh, um, next someone said something else? Um, I'm not too sure. It, chapter 10 was working with an awful lot of oh, string oh, 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 I heard someone said someone else, something else. Uh, I'm not sure, Mike. You, you and I are the only ones on, I think, right now. Okay. All right, so there's there's just the two of us. Do you have any other questions um, regarding this webinar? Oh, that's right. You guys don't put up the lab and uh, in class up, right? Uh, that's not part of the webinar, no. Oh, right, right, right. I almost forgot. Okay, then. This is... Have a nice weekend, then. Okay, good, Mike. Okay, you're all set, then. Thank you for participating, Mike, and uh, have a good weekend, and we'll see you Monday.